the epistle for this 22nd Sunday after Pentecost. <coughs> Excuse me, it's from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. Brethren, I am convinced in the Lord Jesus that he who has begun a good work in you will bring it to perfection until the day of Christ Jesus. And I have a right to feel so about you all because I have you in my heart, all of you, alike in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel as sharers in my joy. For God is my witness how I long for you all in the heart of Christ Jesus. And this I pray that your charity may more and more abound in knowledge and in all discernment so that you may approve the better things, that you may be upright and without offense unto the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of justice through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. At that time, the Pharisees went and took counsel how they might trap Jesus in his talk. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art truthful, that thou teachest the way of God in truth, that thou carest not for any man, for thou dost not regard the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what dost thou think? Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar? or not. But Jesus, knowing their wickedness, said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin of the tribute. So they offered him a denarius. Then Jesus said to them, Whose are this image and the inscription? They said to him, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. That's the words of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, I know I always sound like it, but today I really am losing uh, what voice I have. This... Um, Mass is offered for the poor souls in purgatory. One way to approach this incident where Jesus is asked about the uh, uh, paying of a tax or tribute to Caesar is to look at Jesus' interlocutor's mistakes. What mistakes do the Pharisees and, and the Herodians make uh, in trying to question Jesus. First and biggest is they underestimate Jesus. The Pharisees, according to Monsignor Boylan, uh, he's speculating that the Pharisees probably sent younger disciples of theirs in that group uh, who would be more likely to ask such a, a question that the rabbis had talked about, argued about for years and years. And uh, so they would be, they figured they would be more innocent looking and more uh, likely to ask a question like that. And the Herodians, because uh, even though they collaborated with the Romans, their ultimate goal of the Herodians was to restore a Jewish monarchy. So that if Jesus answered no, don't pay the tax to Caesar, then one would think uh, they would have, the Herodians would have no objection at all. And it might lead Jesus to say something more radical against the Roman rule. So they, their biggest mistake was the flattery. And there's a great irony here because they say all these good things about Jesus, about his truthfulness and all, and they're all true but they don't mean them, and they're saying them with the idea, the mistake they're making is they think that he's just as conniving as they are. He's likely to be swayed by this sort of thing, and of course he's not. 
So they are speaking literally the truth, but they're doing it in definitely the wrong way. Rome had only taken direct control of Palestine about 6 AD. Roman tax was an affront to uh, Jewish nationalism and to the Jewish idea that their proper government was a theocracy and not a government of men. Moreover, in uh, Exodus 20, verse 23, it said that all graven images were abominations, speaking particularly of images of people. So the Romans had, uh, in deference to this belief of the Jews, they had uh, minted dinars, a basic coin about worth about a day's wage, with the images of palm trees or olive trees and all. But they also made them for the whole empire uh, with, the, with the image of Caesar on them, the reigning Caesar. Not only had the image, but also the words, son of the divine Augustus, that is his predecessor. And on the other side, high priest. So he's son of the divine Augustus and he's also a high priest. And these are how, what the tax had to be paid in. So the money changers were definitely busy around tax time. Uh, the dilemma that they put, try to put Jesus in is if he says pay the tax, he'll alienate most of the Jewish population. Uh, on the other hand, if he says don't pay the tax, they can report him to the Romans for inciting, shall we say, an insurrection. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Their mistake, they thought he was low down and conniving like they were. Second mistake, I can spend less time on it, uh, Jesus calls them hypocrites because he knew they all had these emperor dinars, as they're called, the emperor coins, in their pockets, in their own pockets anyway. Uh, so they're hypocrites. They're trying to catch him on that point, and yet there they are with the same coins already for spending money. And thirdly, Jesus points out to them that there's no dilemma at all, no necessary opposition between the duties to the state and the duties to God. A state is willed by God to secure the temporal, that is, in time and space, welfare of its citizens. The kingdom of God is concerned with the salvation of souls, with the eternal. Subjection to human authority is lawful insofar it is it, as it is compatible with the payment of one's debts to God. For example, a very timely example, COVID has brought this issue to the forefront. The government doesn't have the right to close churches, to stop worship. No human authority has that right. Nor to force vaccinations because we are people who are in the image of God and we do have the right to our bodies. In the Middle Ages, there was a two swords theory I've mentioned before, where the state has a right for role and it wields a sword through its police and military power. The church wields the sword of the spirit and it is superior to the state because it has the duty to determine, at least in general terms, when and in what manner the state may use its sword. So, uh, Mitch and Shri note that Caesar has, a claim, according to the Talmud, which came after Jesus' time, uh, Caesar has a claim uh, on who, wherever his coinage is in use, wherever they're using these coins with his image or with one of the other images put there by the Romans, uh, that means that uh, they accept their authority. They are playing by the Romans' rules of what the money's worth and, and uh, when it can be used and so forth. 
Uh, the uh, God, on the other hand, has a total claim on the human person in any circumstance who bears the image of a living God. One's highest obligation, therefore, is to give himself back to God, hopefully perfected, more or less, through grace. Neither to the state nor on behalf of the state is one to give uh, give in this manner. What we have, if you want to understand our times, one of the one of the keys to it is that the governments around the world are insisting that they are going to take the place of God and they want to have control over every aspect of our lives. That's what's at stake. They are trying to dethrone God. And uh, we, I'm proud to say, are in their way. This is why the church until recent decades uh, never spoke of freedom of religion. After all, no one has a right to be wrong on fundamental questions of our existence. We may tolerate, but don't say freedom of religion. Instead, she speaks of the liberty of the church to spread the gospel and thus fulfill its mandate from Jesus Christ. Now we are in a system where the freedom of religion as it's in the Constitution is something that works in our favor if it's observed, and of course it hasn't been, uh, but uh, hopefully the courts will eventually sh uh, sift that one out. Um, but what we really should be standing for is the liberty of the church to spread the gospel. Thus the prayers after low mass. Hear our prayers for the conversion of sinners and for the liberty and exaltation of our Holy Mother, the Church. Fulfilling our duties to others in a way that is morally acceptable to God, important qualifier, both in the civil and ecclesial spheres is, not to, is, is to fulfill our duty to God. The highest summit of the Mass is the consecration of the elements whereby our sacrificial Lord in his sacred humanity is made present once again to be offered for our sakes to his Father in heaven. In that way, we fulfill our most basic and necessary duty to God, but not exclusive duty to God, uh, of proper and devoted worship. For those who believe, all the rest will follow. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.